Some members call it Lancer. I'd like to thank you all for coming for the Sunday Lord Feast. There's anyone here for the time for the first time to this temple? Anyone for the first time? So we'll have our Sunday speaker. His Grace Gopura Prabhu. Gopura Prabhu, the disciple of His Holiness Jai Pataka Swami Maharaj. I want to represent Guru and Acharya of Islam. Gopura Prabhu is a very old disciple of Jai Maharaj. He's been serving this temple for many years. So let's welcome Gopura Prabhu for the Sunday speak. I'd like to raise your hand and chant Hare Krishna one time. That's the best way to welcome the devotees. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Thank you. So, after the Sunday lecture, we'll have Kirtan, more Kirtan, and there will be more announcements, and then there's Prashad also. So I know in the daytime we had a big crowd. Uh, we had almost 250 people came. So how many people come in the evening, we don't know, but we are spring more people. Uh, they will push out around 6 p.m. So please stay us, stay with us. Hear Krishna Katha from the devotee, like Gopuraj Prabhu, and chant and dance with us and be happy. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah. 
Srila Prabhupada gives uh, quite a bit of information about Srila Jiva Goswami. Tanra Madhye Rupa Sanatana Badasaka Anupama Jiva Rajendradi Upas Shaka. The translation, English. Among these branches, Rupa and Sanatana were principal. Anupama, Jiva Goswami, and others headed by Rajendra were their sub-branches. So this whole chapter delineates the different branches that spread out from Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself. Uh, and as I mentioned, these six Goswamis were directly empowered by him in various ways to do preaching uh, and to distribute this message. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. In the Gora Ganodesha Dipika, text 195, it is said that Srila Jiva Goswami was formerly Vilasa Manjari Gopi. How many are familiar with the Gora Ganodesha Dipika? Well, so you know what we're discussing. This uh, is a, a short book in that sense, but it was compiled by Kavikana Purna. And what it is, is a compilation of all the different major personalities that took, uh, participated in Krishna's pastimes when he manifested in Vrindavan. And those same personalities, when they again appeared and took, took uh, participated in the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya. So uh, here, starting out, Srila Prabhupada explains who is Jiva Goswami. He was formerly Vilasa Manjari. So that is one of Srimati Radharani's primary associates uh, and a very important personality. Srila Prabhupada continues, from his very childhood, Jiva Goswami was greatly fond of Srimad Bhagavatam. He later came to Navadvip to study Sanskrit, and following in the footsteps of Sri Nityananda Prabhu, he circumambulated the entire Navadvip Dham. After visiting Navadvip Dham, he went to Benares to study Sanskrit under Madhusudana Vasuchapati. And after finishing his studies in Benares, he went to Vrindavan and took shelter of his uncles, Sri Rupa and Sanatana. This is described in the Bhakti Ratnakara. As far as our information goes, Sri Jiva Goswami composed and edited at least 25 books. They are all very much celebrated. <clears throat> so, uh, th this is why I mentioned we're going to be hearing from one of these a little bit. It's, a, it's the first of the Sun Darbas, uh, uh, Jiva Goswami wrote, put together six Sun Darbas. What is a Sun Darba? A Sandharva is a very complex work that aims at uh, revealing what is truth. And you will find if we study Vedas, very few scholars, uh, very few Vaishnavas actually put together such a work because it's very difficult to authenticate what you're doing. It's just like if I ask you to prove something. How, how can you prove it? To prove something, you're going you're gonna to quote somebody or you're going to quote something. You're going to refer to another authority. How do you even prove who you are? What, what do we do? We have to carry around our, a photo ID in case we're stopped or in case of the young How do you prove something? So we're relying on this little card or whatever to prove who we are. In fact, I would be bold enough to suggest most people in this Kali Yuga 
don't know who they are. Even with the card, the card might have some picture representation, but it's to understand who you are is very important. So uh, Jiva Goswami put together six Sandarvas, and we'll hear a little bit from them, uh, because Srila Prabhupada has said, anyone who wants to understand Srimad Bhagavatam should study the Sandarvas. They give you deep insight. So just a little bit more here. After the disappearance of Srila Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami in Vrindavan, Srila Jiva Goswami became the Acharya of all the Vaishnavas in Bengal, Arisa, and the rest of the world. And it is he who used to guide them in their devotional service. In Vrindavan, he established the Radha Damodar Temple, where after retirement, we had the opportunity to live from 1962 until 1965. Here, Srila Prabhupada basically makes a personal reference in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, you don't find this often, but because he is in the Guru the Super Succession, once in a while he, he gives some clues. And, and all he's saying is that he himself lived at this temple, Radha Damodar Temple, from 1962 until 1965, when he came to the United States. Uh, when Jiva Goswami was still present, Srila Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami compiled his famous Chaitanya Charitamrita, which is a book we're reading right now. Later, Srila Jiva Goswami inspired Srinivas Acharya, Naranam Das Thakur, and Duki Krishnadas to preach Krishna consciousness in Bengal. Jiva Goswami was informed that all the manuscripts that had been collected from Vrindavan and sent to Bengal for preaching purposes were plundered near Vishnupur in Bengal. But later he received, received the information that the books had been recovered. Sri Jiva Goswami awarded the designation Kaviraj to Ramachandra Sena, a disciple of Srinivas Acharya, and to Ramachandra's younger brother, Govinda. While Sri Jiva Goswami was alive, Sri Mati Janavi Devi, the pleasure potency of Sri Nityananda Prabhu, went to Vrindavan with a few devotees. Sri Jiva Goswami was very kind to the Gaudiya Vaishnavas and Vaishnavas from Bengal. Whoever went to Vrindavan, he provided for the residents and prasadam. His disciple, Krishnadas Adhikari, listed all the books of the Goswamis in his diary. So that's a little bit. This, this uh, bibliography Srila Prabhupada gives continues. Uh, but we're going to switch now to uh, hearing from this Tatwa Sandarva the first of the six Sandaris, and uh, get some of the nectar that Srila Jiva Goswami has given the world. Keep in mind some of these details, like he's not an ordinary soul. He was already in Krishna's pastimes, but Lord Chaitanya requested so many uh, permanent Nitya Siddhas to accompany him when he manifested 500 years ago. And Jiva Goswami is one of them. Formerly he was uh, this gopi, uh, Vilasa. So we're going to hear from uh, this Tatva Sandarva. Tatva, you might be familiar with the word, most of you might know it. Tatwa means truth, basically, in English. So Tatwa. This uh, Sandarva, the first one, he's aiming at establishing a lot of basic things, but in a way that once you hear it, you can't, it can't be defeated. There's no way to get around it. And he starts uh, with this verse, which is not a verse that he composed. 
And that's, I'll explain that maybe a little later on. But this verse is from Srimad Bhagavatam. Krishna Varnam Tusha Krishnam Sangopas Grastra Prashadam Yagnai Sankirtana Prayar Yajanti Hi Sumedasa. Translation In the age of Kali, intelligent persons perform congregational chanting to worship the Lord who constantly sings the names of Krishna. Although his complexion is not blackish, he is Krishna himself. He is accompanied by his associates, servants, weapons, and confidential companions. So this is from the 11th Canto, Chapter 5, Text 33 in Srimad Bhagavatam. And um, Gopi Pranandana Prabhu explains that why Krishna Das Kaviraj chose this verse instead of writing a little introduction of it, his own doing. Most acharyas always, when they begin something, they begin with a Mangala Charna, a little introductory verse of uh, a prayer to inform you about that. But here uh, we begin with this verse. In the age of Kali, intelligent persons perform congregational chanting to worship the Lord who constantly sings the names of Krishna. Although his complexion is not blackish, he is Krishna himself. He is accompanied by his associates, servants, weapons, and confidential companions. So there's a lot in that verse. Uh, a lot to understand. Because it's directly uh, referencing Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the Bhagavatam. So those who are familiar with Vedic study understand everything must be substantiated. You can't just say John Doe is an avatar. He's the new Krishna. And you can't say things like that. There is no new Krishna. There's only established avatars of Krishna. So when it's said that Lord Chaitanya is non-different than Krishna, how is this substantiated? So Rupa, uh, Jiva Goswami, is, is, his aim is to substantiate this statement and all the statements in Srimad Bhagavatam by giving us this information. And the way he's going to do that, we're going to see in just a second how he starts off this, this process. But again, this, uh, this verse represents uh, Lord Chaitanya. Although his complexion is not blackish, Usha Krishna, uh, he is Krishna himself. So Lord Chaitanya was known to have a very golden complexion, very radiantly golden complexion. And Krishna was known to be Shiva Sundra, like a, a new rain cloud, a bluish, blackish effulgence, which our language, especially English, any language, reaches a limitation to understand. Because we can say such and such color, but it always references something we already know. If I say uh, this is like orange color, you know, you know what orange is, so you have an understanding. But how can you substantiate out of the clear blue? How, how, why would this be orange? Maybe you would think this is blue. And you can argue with me. You can say, no, that's no longer orange. We're gonna, it's going to be blue from now on. So you have to know how to establish what is a fact and what is not a fact. And that is what Srila Jiva Goswami is doing here. And that is why one of the very small reasons he chose as a Mangalachana introduction to this book, a verse already written in Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, so we're going to hear now just a little bit about what, what are those six sandharvas, you hear me talking about them. Uh, 
Here in this purport, we see the overall plan of the Sundarvas is as follows. The first, Sri Tattva Sundarva, will establish the Sambandana in general terms by proving Sri Jiva Goswami's thesis that Srimad Bhagavatam is the most appropriate source of spiritual knowledge in the Kali Yuga. Big sentence, but there it is. That's what he's setting out to prove. Srimad Bhagavatam is the most uh, appropriate source of knowledge in the Kali Yuga. You mean it's not the Encyclopedia Britannica? It's not William, uh, what's his name, uh, Meredith uh, Dictionary? It's not uh, the biology books you find at Emory University? No. The, the, the greatest source of information available to anyone is Srimad Bhagavatam. So it's easy for me to say it, it's easy for anyone to say it, but how do you substantiate that? That is a major endeavor. And that again is what Srila Jiva Goswami is getting at. To continue here, uh, the, most the next three, that is the Bhagavat Sandarva, Paramatma Sandarva, and Krishna Sandarvas will elaborate on Sambandana through explanations given in Srimad Bhagavatam about the special character of the Personality of Godhead, his relation with the manifold energies, and his most essential identity as Sri Krishna. So those are the next three Sandarvas. He's going to cover Bhagavat, Bhagavan. <coughs> We've heard this word. Bhagavad, what the, the Supreme God, who is God? What is God like? Paramatma. Paramatma, in, in English, Srila Prabhupada says the super soul. The super soul that sits in everybody's heart. Whether you're 99 years old, 9 years old, 9 months old, 9 days old, 9 seconds old, Paramatma is there in the heart of every living entity. And we go around every day with Paramatma there and we do some things that Paramatma tries to remind us, but we, we forget. I, I should say, I forget. I won't speak for the whole crowd. But Paramatma, the super soul in the heart, accompanies every living entity to this world, birth after birth. So then uh, the fifth uh, Sandharva is called Bhakti Sandharva, which presents the methods of devotional practice through statements from Srimad Bhagavatam. And the sixth Sri Priti Sandharva will discuss pure love of God according to the Bhagavatam. But before we can elucidate these topics, we must first settle the question of pramana, the reliable means of ascertaining facts. We need to determine how, in general, human beings can arrive at a correct understanding of things. Pramana, as defined in the epistemology of Jnana Darshan, means pramana karana, quote, an instrumental cause of valid knowledge. Valid knowledge is further defined as perception that agrees with reality. Perception that agrees with reality. So if I tell you this is not a laptop, this is a big cookie, and you can come take a bite, it doesn't agree with reality. And you can say, he's just a liar. He's being facetious. It's not correct. So. That's one way we can validate something. But that's, he goes on, that's not what we're after at this point. Vaishnava acharyas accept the Nyaya theory of pra pra Pramana with some modifications. But the Nyaya theory is not the only one. 
Each school of thought in India has its own conception of pramana and pra pramana. What true knowledge is, to what extent it can be achieved, and how. Buddhist logicians, for example, prefer to define true knowledge in ways other than by correspondence to real things, because they deny that things exist at all. That's a mouthful, but in essence, you can see that's really nonsense. It's total nonsense. Because you have to deal with it. What? You have to deal with real things all the time in this real material world. I can't say this is something that is not and try to make it into something else. It's, it's a particular functioning thing. So the Buddhists, uh, especially the way it was originally started, to deceive those people that were attached to animal slaughter, got changed later on. But uh, they now have dwindled into this, uh, everything uh, is going to merge into this one, uh, What's the word they use? Uh, they use the word nirvana. It, it's, you're going to merge into your nirvana, so you won't exist. If, if you're just going to merge into the totality of this existence, this nirvana, supposedly pleasure. And as soon as you say pleasure, again, you're referring to a personality. Because how can you just have pleasure? Can you just have something separate from the thing itself. Like here's, here's a cup of water they provided for me. Can I take out, from this water, can I take out the wetness? And just say, here's some wetness. You can't separate wetness from water. You can't separate heat from fire. You can't, you can't take the light that emanates from fire and pull it out and say, I don't want, I don't need the fire, I just want to use the light. You can't. If I just want the light in this room, and I cut the chandelier down and bring it down here, what happens? No light. It's disconnected from the source. Everything requires a source. So if we think our existence is separate from the source, then Jiva Goswami wants us to reconsider. Let us reconsider what's going on. Uh, to continue with this, <clears throat> they do not accept that any reality ex extending in time and space beyond the raw phenomena of each separate moment. Buddhists instead define truth in terms of capacity to inspire purposeful activity and in terms of consistency. True knowledge is knowledge that creates no contradiction. So that's a basic nyaya bindu. That's a proposition that they speak about. <clears throat> Sri Bhagavat Sandarbha aims at the highest kind of knowledge obtainable, personal realization of the absolute truth. The, the, personal realization of the absolute truth. Now I'm, I'm backing up to what, to read this actual verse that Srila Jiva Goswami wrote. This verse has alluded to various topics. Sri Krishna, then Sambandana, or relation between him and the words that described him, and then what we are enjoined to do, or in other words, Abhideya, the recommended practice of worshiping Him, and finally, Prayojana, the goal or love for Him. So, Sambandha Abhideya Prayojana, and the huge, that's what the Bhagavatam is all about. Understanding uh, uh, our relationship with the Supreme, and then how to act in that relationship. Because if you're, uh, if you tell me I'm the number one guitar player in Atlanta, so I say, can you, you give a little demo, <laughs> make a little music? 
And you say, well, I don't, I don't actually carry a guitar. Well, how you, well, can you play something a little later? No, I, I don't really play. So right away, what's our conclusion? This is nonsense. There's no such thing as you being the number one guitar player when you don't even play the instrument. So uh, you have to understand those three aspects. So, uh, what is it? Uh, Sambandha, Abhideya, and Prayojana. How they relate. You can't separate one thing and not incorporate the rest. But he says, before we can elucidate these topics, we must first settle the question of pramana, the reliable means of ascertaining facts. So that's a good word to remember, definitely, pramana, the reliable means of ascertaining facts. In that regard, since an ordinary person is tainted by four faults, beginning with incorrect judgment, and especially because his fault faculties, such as sensory perceptions, are inadequate for establishing contact with a reality whose nature is supramundane and inconceivable, those faculties are faulty. So in a nutshell, what are we talking about? We all have, everybody in this room has five senses. Everybody. And we use them every day. What is the first one? Eye, sight, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touch. That's all we, those are the only senses we have. That's how we gather all kinds of information. When we're young, like this nice little baby, they touch everything. Why? Because they want to understand. It's not that, of course, as parents, we're always saying, no, no, this is not good, that's not good. But the baby is learning so many things simply by touching the, the quality of something. How does this microphone feel? It's nice. So the, we have all these senses, and this is how we get our information. What, Rup, what Jiva Goswami just said is that's not enough because they're all faulty. We can't see, like, we can't see what's up on the corner of Ponce de Leon and Orland Avenue right now. The eyes don't reach. I can't see what they're doing in the next room. We don't know what they're doing. Maybe some of you can hear what they're talking about. I can't hear what they're saying. No idea. So our senses are very limited. Can anybody smell what's being cooked to offer the Krishna right now? We don't know what the prasada might be tonight. The nose doesn't reach in there. Sometimes we can get some little aroma. And certainly if I say, how does this tree feel outside the window? Who can, you can't do it. You have to go out there and touch it. So our senses are limited and faulty. And Jiva is explaining, don't rely on this if you want to get to the absolute truth. So, I'm going to jump way ahead in this book. We're, we're going to miss some information because we're only doing a summary study of this. But categorically, he begins to explain why we're not going to rely on just the, the census to explain something. Why we're not just going to rely on what our good friend Johnny Smith told us. Johnny told us that if you go in the next room, in the next 10 minutes, and sign on this paper, I'll give you one gold brick. And I, my, he's my friend, so I'm going to go in there and do it. That's not reliable information. Even though he's your friend, you can't rely on that kind of information. Even if it comes from a so-called, even if Mother and father tell you something that comes from an a uncredited source. Then you have to look at it a different way. So Jiva Goswami is speaking to the mass of people that we need to know how to get the most accurate information. 
So we're going we're gonna to skip ahead to his Sarva Samadini. Uh, and this section is, is like a commentary he wrote on the first book. He himself, knowing that the first book is very complicated, he starts to break it down even further so that we can get a better grasp on what he's talking about. Uh, he writes, the text beginning Tatra Purushasya states that although ten means of acquiring valid knowledge are known, sensory perception, logic, verbal testimony, the opinion of sages, analogy, hypothetical inference, absence, inclusion, tradition, and gesture, the fundamental means of knowing is but one, one, namely, you ready? The fundamental means of knowing is one, verbal testimony. So that's running through our brains. There, there seems to be some contradiction there. The fundamental means of knowing the absolute truth is verbal testimony. Let's continue to see what he tells us. The second half of this verse. This one means consists of statements free from the flaws of inattention, false perception, the tendency to deceive, and inadequate power of the senses. So he's not talking about what our friend John Smith just told us. That's verbal testimony. Not tell, he's not giving us what Professor John Doe told us in school. That's verbal testimony. One plus one is two. I think, I think that's still true. Two plus two is four. Yeah, that's, so you get that kind of knowledge in school. That's a type of verbal testimony. But it's not what Srila Jiva Goswami is talking about. We have to continue. Because, there, because the other nine means are mostly flawed by false perception and so on, they tend to give knowledge contrary to the facts. And so people are uncertain whether these are proper means or only shadow means of understanding. Because the one means is free from those weaknesses, the other nine depend on it for becoming firmly rooted. Just as the subjects of a king depend on him for their sustenance. Other reasons for the superiority of flawless verbal testimony are that it does not depend on any of the others. That although the, the others may assist it, as far as they are able, this one independent means of knowing in performing its function is even seen to overrule the others. That a fact established by the one means is ir irreversible by the others. And finally, that it is most effective in proving facts that the power of the others means cannot even touch. That's a lot. So, what are we talking about? Who has some idea? Is anyone? What, what are we talking about? We just, I know I'm, I'm giving a lot of information. I myself, I have, it's not that I have memorized this, but I understand. There are ten ways that anybody, whether we are here at the temple, whether we're at Harvard University, wherever we are, there are ten ways that we get information and we use it to, to get to do other things. And we just went over those ten ways. Uh, <clears throat> sensory perception, meaning our senses, which we discussed. Logic. Logic is uh, something very simple to understand. If I, if I throw a ball in the air, what's going to happen? It comes down. Logic. That's logic. Why? Because we know the principle of gravity works in this world. If I throw a cup of water up in the air, what happens? 
It's gonna come now. It's gonna, I'm gonna splash everybody, and then you're, you're gonna attack me with a stick and nonsense guy. So logic tells us many things. We use logic. When we see something that's not logical, we begin to question it. Because we're, we're thinking, if I throw this water up and the water just sits in the air, something is drastically amiss here. How can water just sit in the air? In our everyday world, it's not possible. So we know that, but if it does happen, how do we explain it? This is what Jiva Goswami is getting at, believe it or not. Verbal testimony, we already went over that. That can be true or false. So you can't depend on it. Uh, the opinion of sages, very erudite people, scholars, professors, that can be changed. For instance, uh, many years ago, people had no idea that bacteria exist. If you discuss bacteria and germs, they would tell you you're crazy. How did I get sick? Such and such bacteria, you caught it. And the streptococcus thing went in your throat, and now you're sick. Nowadays, through microscopes or whatever, they can back this up. So it's a type of... Uh, Knowledge coming from an authority. Uh, many years ago, it was understood through the Vedas that the substance, cow dung, is pure. There's no germs grow in cow dung. About six or seven years back, maybe a little longer now, in one uh, university study, they studied cow dung. And they came to the amazing conclusion Hey, no bacteria grows in this stuff. Of course, some places, India, other places in the Orient, cow dung has been used and understood as a totally different substance. It's not something that's impure. It can actually purify us if we use it properly. So again, the opinion of sages, so-called knowledgeable people, can change. But the opinion, we see the opinion of Verbal testimony coming from the authoritative source does not change. And we're getting to that shortly. Uh, hypothetical inference. Uh, that means that's a type, the way you uh, would go about proving something because something already is known about a particular state or a particular object. So you can guess what's going to happen. If I tip this cup over, most likely the water is going to roll across the floor to some degree. Hypothetical inference. Absence. Sometimes we, through absence, we can tell what something is. If I say, on the table is a nice bowl of fruit, there's no bowl of fruit here, it's absent. But if he brings in the fruit from the kitchen or wherever, we can see, yeah, there is a, a bowl of fruit there. But we understand something, a bowl and fruit, through, though those objects are absent from us right now, you, un, you understand what they are because you have, it's already embedded in the mind. So you can prove something in that manner. Inclusion, another way of proving tradition, we're all victims of tradition. Our parents, our friends, they tell us so many things and we accept it. Sometimes we reject it and we accept a lot of things we try it. Just because it's a, tradi a tradition. We've been doing this for 50 years. We've been doing this for 200 years. I remember my great, 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 great grandfather used to do this. Maybe it's correct, maybe it's not. It's not a way you can prove something emphatically. And uh, gesture. Hello. What am I doing? Waving. I'm saying hi. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> you see me waving? That's a gesture. Most places it's recognized. If, I, if you say, are you feeling good today, Prabhu? Yeah. What is, what is thumbs up? It's a gesture. It means, yeah, everything is good. Okay, whatever. 
gesture. So there are good gestures and bad gestures. So we see what in conclusion here, Jiva Goswami is saying, don't rely on those methods because they can have some, some aspect of untruth. And what he's promoting is verbal testimony. And here is what he said, actually says about verbal testimony. Among the other means, sensory perception is uh, generated by the mind and the five knowledge acquiring senses. And thus it appears in six forms. After each of these six can be either reflective or non-reflective. And this results in 12 varieties. Sensory perception has two more divisions. Perception by those who are wise and by those who are not. That's the key part of this statement. And we're going to skip ahead just a little bit for the sake of time we, to give a little bit more of what he's talking about. <clears throat> we're going into the conclusion. In, in this way we can conclude that verbal testimony, Shabda, is the only certain means for acquiring valid knowledge. And having thus concluded, we should consider precisely what this Shabda is. To define Shabda as language free from faults like delusion will not suffice. So he, he's actually even, what he's doing is including himself because he's telling us a certain thing. To define Shabda as language free from faults like delusion will not suffice. That definition is inadequate because everyone thinks his own opinion free from delusion and the other such faults and that leaves us no way to ascertain the relative value of differing opinions. I'm letting you soak that in. Another reason this definition is inadequate is that it would make verbal testimony, which is of necessity, is acquired through the senses, depends on another means of knowing. And this would divest verbal testimony of its authority. Very important thing he's saying here. Very important. Because we just said, in a nutshell, don't depend on what somebody's telling you. But here he's saying verbal testimony, uh, which is free from all these flaws. So let's go on to more of, it, of his conclusion in the following text. Therefore, the Shabda, we mean to indicate here, is that which everyone studies to become learned, and by which anyone, upon understanding it, can become learned in all subjects. It imparts the ultimate wisdom that purifies sensory perception and the other means of knowing. It is the Shabda self-manifested since time immemorial, the total corpus of authoritative statements, the basis of all traditional knowledge. That is the something he's talking about. That is the verbal testimony. Self-manifested since time immemorial. That's a key phrase. He continues. It's a long explanation. This Shabda is none other than the revealed scripture known as the Vedas. The eternally manifest verbal expression that has no human author and that appears with no beginning in time from the cause of all, the personality of Godhead. It appears from him again and again at the beginning of each cycle of creation. The Vedas are presumed free from all such faults as delusion and must always be accepted as authoritative by those who want to receive the instruction of the Lord, the generator of all. The Vedas are the infallible means 
for correct knowledge. And it is by the mercy of the Supreme Lord that some people accept them. Let fools with hearts hardened by faulty logic reject them. What can be done to dispel the misfortune of such fools? They have no means for acquiring reliable knowledge. Srila Jiva Goswami Ki! So, who has questions on what we just read? Who can see the point here? We have to rely on Sabda Ram, and that is because this verbal testimony always existed. So what we're actually talking about is Krishna. So you can't... Yes, Mataji. Well, he, he goes on because his, his whole aim is focused on Srimad Bhagavatam. He narrows it down because in, we're, we're skipping way ahead to other things. But he mentions that in Kali Yuga, he already knew this 500 years ago, proper study of the Vedas in general is not even possible. And that was in his day and time. What to speak 500 years later, it's not possible. Even though the Vedas are Sabda Brahmi. So we have to hear from an authoritative source. Ultimately, we understand the Guru who's in the authoritative Guru Parampara. That's how we can check if it is a source. So if Guru is saying, this is okay to hear and read this part, so this is how we know something is or can be authenticated. Otherwise, we can't. Because, as we mentioned before, we all have faulty senses, even in our study of the Vedas, we have to be very careful. Just because a book, we pick up a book and it says the uh, such and such Veda, the Rig Veda. Who to, in today's world can competently read and evaluate what's there? Who? How many people know the correct pronunciation of Rig Veda mantras? They're not, they're not sounded like mantras we have from the Bhagavatam. It's a whole separate pronunciation of how to, to study each of those different Vedas, the four different Vedas. And Srila Veda Vyasadeva gave that information to different authorities that would pass it on. But again, in the Kali Yuga, the part we're in, and we're just in the beginning, it's not possible to really dive in and so he, that's why he's leading us through these. Once you read these six Sandarbhas, you know Srimad Bhagavatam is the only thing you need to pick up and study. And he shows you through the Bhagavatam, because the Bhagavatam says this and that, this and that, about the Bhagavatam. So it's Krishna speaking about Krishna. And how do you know about someone? If you say, Prabhu, how do you feel today? He can't answer. I have to answer you. I feel okay. But if he says, oh, he's very sick, he's on his last leg, hopefully <laughs> it's not true. So you know if it comes from me. So we know if we hear from Krishna, Bhagavad Gita, we know it's, it's correct. And that is uh, Jiva's aim, that uh, we get away from this faulty understanding and we begin to understand what is Shabda Brahm. Because people in this day and age, they challenge us all the time. They're going to say, you know, you read this book, what's the difference between what you read? So you have to know this information. Otherwise, of course, sometimes, and I've encountered in my little journey, sometimes uh, distributing books, I, I encountered this often in the airport, that People just like to argue with you. And once, once you see that, it's, it's, you're wasting your time. If they just want to argue, that's just another book, or this is something, this is just a, some kind of cult thing, you can politely dismiss yourself from the, the conversation and go on to the next. But uh, uh, otherwise, Srila Prabhupada is recommended. We study the writings of the predecessor Acharyas. And he, he employed Gopi Pranadana Prabhu from the very beginning uh, in translation. That his whole career was uh, 
working with the BBT, and he was one of the prominent devotees, uh, Gobi Brandana Prabhu, uh, Rita Ayananda Maharaj. They completed translating the 12th canto in the mood that Srila Prabhupada had done the rest. Actually, they did the 11th and 12th canto. So they're prominent uh, and very competent Sanskrit uh, scholars in their own right, modern day era. So uh, Srila Prabhupada recommended again that we study this in order to broaden our, our understanding of Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, because somebody might want to plant a seed of doubt in our own mind and heart. Say, oh, maybe I'm not doing the right thing. But if, you, if you're concretely established on the Tattva Sandharva, no one can do that. No one, it, it, you can easily see through the fallacy of all these other things. And you can uh, easily pick apart another person's so-called logical explanation when you, when you get into what, what they're telling you. Sometimes you can even ask a person, could you just analyze what you just said to me? Can you break it down and explain it a little better? And usually they can't. It's only a fixed statement that they want to defeat you with. Any anyone else? Yes, Matthew. Okay, Krishna. So, um, I was just wondering, I guess, in terms just to understand when I'm doing book distribution or sharing Krishna knowledge with someone. What is the predominant uh, method that's being used um, like in the telling of in this day and age where um, people are considering the their where they get their authority. You know, like what's their authority? What's the top way? Like you mentioned these different ways, you know, like there's gestures and there's, you know, um, um, other different methods. So what is the predominant method in this day and age that's being used? The predominant method of those ten ways of acquiring knowledge. Ultimately, as we just read, uh, Chiva Goswami is, re is recommending verbal testimony, meaning coming from the Shastra, from the Guru. Because not, not the verbal testimony we get in regular world situations. Some of it is reliable, some of it is not. But the recommended way is uh, like Srila Prabhupada established from the very beginning. Hearing from the authority, uh, one of his first books, Bhagavad Gita, he translated, so it, it would come from the Guru Parampara. When, when a lady asked him, what Bhagavad Gita should I read? He had to translate it himself because the other, there were like close to 300 versions that had been done by various scholars, and a lot of them in English. But he, he hadn't found one that he could recommend to read to get the actual substance. So here's Bhagavad Gita that Mr. So-and-so, Professor Smith, translated. He knows Sanskrit and whatever. But we see no one became a devotee from reading that type of book. There might be some knowledge there, but it's not coming. It's not this verbal testimony from the Guru Parampara. So the prominent way is to hear from the Shastra. And you're hearing, every time you read Srimad Bhagavatam, you're hearing, his, per, the purports are written by Srila Prabhupada. You're hearing his translation and purports. So even though we don't have immediate direct contact to come and listen to Srila Prabhupada, we can listen and hear through the Bhagavatam. Because he pointed out, that reading the books are the same as hearing the Acharya. So, Prabhu, what is, what is the way that most people, which, which, which one is being most dominant now, like, outside of that? Which, I didn't catch the word. I was asking which method is being dominated now, like, I, I, I get what you're saying, like, that's the one that we should get is the verbal um, testimony. testimony. But which other method is being dominated now, outside of that? Uh, being used by other people or yeah. by devotees? Yeah, like in Kali Yuga now. Well, to, to some degree, all of them are being used. Uh, yeah, that was the prior session. Uh, 
Well, sensory perception, that's obviously being used. Um, verbal testimony, opinion from sages, analogy, hypothetical inference. That's very popular in science. They use this, this methodology. Uh, in, in scientific fields, they use that, this, uh, the idea that a real experiment has to be able, you have to be able to duplicate it, replicate a particular thing to say that it's such and such. So if they say that this particular micro under the microscope, we see this particular micro causes sore throat, streptococcus. Another scientist in Europe can find the same micro and see and get the same result. That's that's a general idea. So that that's the kind of methodology they use. So those things are all of them kind of bunched together, people use. They, they use it in all aspects. If you, if you look at the, the Hubble telescope, of course most of us haven't seen it, myself yeah. included, but it's out there. That telescope was built with human ingenuity. In other words, it's flawed from the very beginning because you can't see properly how to build the proper telescope to see everything. So to the best of their ability, they built a telescope with computed parts to send information. But in essence, it's flawed. And we see we haven't received any uh, earth-shattering news from the Hubble telescope to change the outlook of mankind. Where is it? Nothing. It's just floating around in space. So like this, we use the senses all the time. Uh, to build a proper telescope, again, you need proper eyesight. To, to uh, engineer anything, you need some background in how to construct and engineer things. But nothing is without fault. So all of those ten ways are, are incorporated. Some people rely on one or two more than others. Uh, so here, Jiva Goswami covered them all and then breaks them down basically and then just jumps to what he's, what he's aimed at and what, what's the difference between regular testimony, regular talk and this Sabda Brahman. And it, the, the conclusion there was that it came from Krishna. Krishna is the only one who could produce it. So that sound vibration came into the material world. Uh, Shukadev Goswami explained to King Parichi the King Parichit had really the same question when he asked, how can the Vedas uh, speak about the absolute truth when the Vedas are using material sound vibration? How, how can they do that? How can they explain? So in that chapter, he begins by explaining everything here was, was brought about by Krishna. Krishna injected everything. So he, he gave the ability to hear, he gave the sound vibration of the Vedas, and to those who are inclined, they can pick up that sound vibration. And even here at the end of this, Jiva Goswami politely says, you know, those who refuse to accept it, you know, it's just foolish. And we have to kindly, we don't want to offend anyone, but kindly dismiss it. So if you want to get to that absolute point, that's how it's possible. It has to come from the absolute. Krishna is the absolute. Any, any other questions? I, I, will, I have to stop. I, I got the signal here. <laughs> I have to stop. But the, I, I won't be able to, to read uh, this, but he, he goes on to give more evidence of what he's talking about by citing that you can't even rely on scriptures that uh, were written under some authority that's not the Supreme, because you can get so-called scripture that's written under some authority, but it's not ultimately reliable. But that, I recommend everybody to <laughs> To read Tattva Sandharva, at least if you don't get the other five, a very wonderful, amazing book. Uh, we have to stop at this point.
Shri Prabhupada ki jai. Shri Jiva Goswami ki jai. So, I think Ganesham Guru has something to say.
So Gauranga Prabhu, he has sponsored the Sunday feast just to feed all the Vaishnava and Vaishnavis. Hari Ho! So can you pray for this wonderful devotee, Gauranga Prabhu, for sponsoring Sunday feast for all of us? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Thank you, Brahmadu. Brahmadu is a very nice devotee. He's been coming here for a long time in the temple. I have mentioned a couple of times before also that if you glorify a devotee, Krishna is very pleased with you and Krishna blesses all mercy, all benediction to you. So let's glorify the devotee with loud chanting a one time Hare Krishna for this wonderful devotee. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Thank you. So you can, uh, I'll announce a few things. You can pencil those dates in your calendars. You can come for this wonderful festival that we're gonna, it's gonna coming up in next week on Saturday and Sunday. This local kirtan mela. We're having a very big kirtan mela. So so far online, 250 families have registered. So I think we're expecting a lot of devotees to come here. But anyone can take part. I Even mean, if you're not registered, you can come. It starts at 2 p.m. during the noon hours. And then it will go on until like 8 to 9 p.m. in the night. Uh, so there, you know, there are different devotees in our local community uh, that they want to do kirtan, to our children they want to do kirtan. So this year, uh, Kartik Prabhu and Vedasa Prabhu, they have organized a very beautiful kirtan, the local devotees. Uh, so we're hosting this kirtan festival in the temple from 2 to 8 p.m. So we invite everyone to come Saturday 2 to 8 p.m. Also on Sunday 2 to 8 p.m. Sunday is Akadashi. It's Putra the Akadashi. So we'll be serving Akadashi Prasadam. Uh, then we request the devotees to follow Akadashi. How many of you will follow Akadashi? Uh, very few. So Akadashi then comes every after 15 days of the month. 15 days. So that means there's two Akadashi in each month. So, generally we request the devotees to fast from grains and beans. Sometimes I know people follow Ekadashi by eating bread or chapari, they think it's Ekadashi. But Prabhupada said, no, even Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Ekadashi said, you should not eat rice or bread, wheat. Some vegetables also, we speak from vegetables like beans and all that. So we avoid, but you can take so many other types of Vegetables like cauliflower and all that you can eat in the Kadashita. So, this Akadush is very nice, it's also very pleasing to Krishna and Srimati Radharani. And it gives also bhakti to the devotees if you follow Akadush every 15 days of a month. You can increase your bhakti by chanting. There are so many devotees that fast from even from water on Akadushita. So, at least if you cannot fast fully, you can drink water, you can take fruits. Or you can cook something like, which is not grains, uh, and then you can eat also that. So our kitchen work renovation is almost finished. We'll need another two to three days in the coming week. Uh, maybe Monday to about Tuesday, most probably Tuesday, we will have the kitchen ready, and we'll be able to cook in the kitchen. Uh, so I just like to thank these following devotees who have very generously contributed to this kitchen seva or kitchen renovation that we have done. Please chant Hari Bo for these wonderful devotees who have given their hard-earned money to this seva for kitchen renovation. Uh, we have, on the first place, we have Anand Dalgan family who gets $3,000. Let's chant Hari Bol for this one. Hari Bol! Then we have Ganga Mataji also gave three thousand. She also gave three thousand dollars for the kitchen renovation. Let's give it. Hari Bol! Then we have Krishna Sharan Prabhu who gave five hundred dollars. Hari Bol! Then 
think of Amrita Gurangi Mantis and Suval Saka Prabhu, one thousand dollars. Then Om Prashad Agarwal, he gave ten thousand dollars. And there is also an anonymous general who gave one thousand dollars. And I have few more names, I have a list them there, but next week we'll announce their names. So, almost we are in the process of finishing the kitchen work, but uh, there are some extra more expensive. If somebody wants to do some seva for the kitchen renovation, you can come and see me. Also, for the Kirtan festival, uh, there are, uh, we are having, we are serving only dinner, uh, Saturday and Sunday, both days. So, if somebody wants to sponsor prasadam for the Kirtan festival, you can come and see me or you can see Karthik Prabhu. Uh, so, we are expecting almost on Sunday 400 devotees to come and take prasad on Sunday. And Saturday we are expecting 300 people. Uh, so, there will be a lot of prasad and distribution. During the daytime also we start prasad and put some extra prasad. Because I know 2 o'clock we will start. I know many families come early, so we can also come and take prasad during the noon hours also. That's all for today. So we'll have final darshan of the deities. And uh, we can take the blessing from the Pujari. And the Prasadam will serve inside here in the, in the temple room. Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.